If you have God's word with you this morning, if you would turn with me to Proverbs chapter 11. You know, the good thing about Scripture is you find thanksgiving on just about every page of the Bible. As I was preparing to preach this week, I knew I was preaching through Proverbs and I wanted to continue that. And uh, the Lord just showed me a couple of verses in chapter 11 of Proverbs that just fit perfectly with what I felt like the Lord wanted me to share with you this morning. Proverbs chapter 11, and we're going to read two verses, uh, verses 24 and 25. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and only suffers want. Whoever brings a blessing, or whoever gives a blessing, will be enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. I'll read that in a, in a paraphrase. Well, I don't often do this, but maybe it'll make it a little bit clearer. The message translation says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. And those who help others are helped. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Fathers, we come to the sacred time of our worship service. The time when we listen to what you have to say to us. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak clearly to our hearts today. And that, Father, you would do whatever work in us that you need to do. Father, there be somebody here that doesn't know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would come alongside them and help them to understand what it means to know you in a very personal and a real way. Father, for those of us who are believers in Christ already, Father, I pray if there be any wicked thing in us that, Lord, you would take it out and take it away. Help us to confess that to you and find forgiveness. It comes only from your hand. Father, speak clearly. Open our spiritual eyes and ears that we might see and hear what you want to say to us today. And Father, I pray and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 17, you have an interesting story about a prophet. A prophet by the name of Elijah and a widow lady. The story goes something like this. King Ahab was a wicked king over Israel. And he was leading God's people to sin. And King Ahab thought he was all that in, in today's language. And uh, God just showed him that he wasn't as important as he thought he was. And so God commanded through the prophet Elijah that he was to go and tell King Ahab it was not going to rain again until God said it was going to rain again. And they experienced about a seven year drought. Now you think it's dry around here right now. Can you imagine what it would be if it was like this for seven years without a drop of rain? It'd be a mess. I wouldn't even see Danny mowing his grass. I mean, it'd just be, there wouldn't even be any grass to mow, I guess, if it had drought for seven years. But anyway, God, in the process of doing this, God sent Elijah the prophet. He, said, he promised Elijah he'd take care of him, as God always does, his people. And so he sent Elijah to a widow lady in a town called Zarephath. It was a foreign city. It was not part of Israel. And Elijah enters the city, and he comes to the gates, and he sees this lady here gathering up sticks. And he turns to the lady, and he says to her, Give me something to drink and something to eat. And the lady responded in the following, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug, and now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah responded to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake and bring it to me, and after make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, 
The jar of flour shall not be spent or shall not be empty or shall not run dry. And the jewel of oak, the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Now, imagine that you're that lady. You've got a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And that's all you got. You're in the midst of a drought. There's no other food coming your way. And you decide to yourself, I'm going to go out and I'm going to pick up a few sticks and I'm going to make this last little bread cake for me and my son. I'm going to cook it and we're going to eat it and then we're going to die. Now suppose somebody walks up to you and says, give me your food and take care of my needs first and the Lord will take care of your needs. How would you respond? How do we respond when somebody comes up to us in need? Folks, you and I, we live in the greatest country on this planet. I know we've got our problems, but if you've ever, I've lived in other countries, okay? I'm telling you, we don't have near the problems that other places do. We have been blessed beyond measure in this country. If you don't believe that, just go live somewhere else for about a year or two and realize how other people live. And you'll realize how blessed we really are. I remember when we were in Chile, we were ministering to a family that were members of a little mission church that I, at that point in time, was pastoring that little mission church. They were farmers. Derek, you'd probably appreciate this. Uh, they planted corn. Uh, they didn't have tractors. They had to do it the old-fashioned way. They had a house. And they were considered one of the wealthy ones because their house had, uh, had concrete floor rather than a dirt floor. And they had doors to the house, but they didn't. They had the window frames, but they didn't have any windows in the frames. I remember going to see them. They'd leave their doors open most of the time, and the chickens would come in and eat off the, off the floor. When you need to go to the bathroom, you had to go down the path. They didn't have one in the house. And they were considered some of the better, wealthier people in that area. I've seen a lot worse. I've seen families where children and grandchildren and everybody all lived in the same house. And sometimes out back they would put a little lean-to just so that the husband and wife could have a bed to sleep in by themselves so they wouldn't be in the larger house. If they had to go to the bathroom, they had to get outside and go outside and go into the house, go to the bathroom and come back out. Guys, I just want you to know we are probably the most blessed people on this planet. As we turn our hearts towards Thanksgiving this week, I, I want to share with you some, some very important, a very important way that you can show Thanksgiving to God. We can show thanksgiving to God in a number of different ways, but one way we can show thanksgiving to God is by being a blessing to other people. That's what this passage is about. Being a blessing to others. So how can we bless others? Well, first of all, we can show mercy. Verse 25 indicates whoever brings a blessing uh, will be enriched or blessed. I like the way the Hebrew puts that. The Hebrew text says the soul of blessings will be blessed. In the Hebrew concept, a person didn't have a soul, they were a soul. And so what this text is telling us, the person or the soul of blessings, the person of blessings shall be blessed. If you're a person who blesses other people, you will be blessed. That's what it's trying to tell us. You and I need to bless other people by showing them mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Folks, God has been so gracious to us. He's been so kind to us. He's not treated us as our sins deserve. Listen to Ephesians 1, 7. In Him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption. That means to be bought out of slavery, slavery to sin. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of His grace. In, verse, in chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 in Ephesians, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, 
He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Paul makes it really clear, and the Bible makes it really clear, that we have been the recipients of God's grace. Undeserved favor, that's what the word grace means. Unmerited or undeserved favor. God has treated us not like we deserve to be treated. He has treated us with grace and mercy and kindness. And the Bible says for those of us who are believers in Christ that God has literally raised us up with Christ. We're raised, as the Bible says, to walk in newness of life because we have spiritual life. We have Jesus Christ living in us. And because of that, God has done all of that for us so that in the coming ages, the coming eons, the coming eternity, if you want to translate it that way, in the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable Riches of His grace. Do you, know how much, do you get that? Do you understand that? In age after age after age after age after age after age, eternal, God is going to show us the immeasurable riches of His grace. Started by saving us. But that doesn't stop there. He keeps going on and on and on. Folks, God, if God has done all of this for us, should we not show mercy to other people? You know, one thing we've seen since the election was over with is a lot of people not showing mercy to anybody. For many of them, it's all about me and what I want. It's not about meeting the needs of other people. Folks, if you and I have been blessed by God, should we not share mercy? Did we deserve mercy? No, the Bible says while we were still enemies of the cross of Christ... Christ died for us. We don't deserve to be loved by God, and yet God loves us. God shows us His mercy, and we ought to show other people that same mercy that God has shown us. Somebody has said, the surest road to a joyful life comes from seeking the good of others. If we are merciful to other people, folks, we will store up in God's own bank what we generously expend on the behalf of other people. In other words, God will take notice when you and I are merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we're merciful to other peoples, God takes notice. And God is merciful to us. I could spend a, a whole sermon right there, but let me move on to the next way we can be a blessing to others. Secondly, we can give generously. We can give generously. The Bible passage says here, the one, in verse 24, the one who gives freely, yet grows all the richer. The word freely, gives freely, means literally to get, scatter or disperse. Back during that day and time, it's a, it's a farming metaphor. Back during that day and time, they didn't know anything about row crops. They didn't have this fancy equipment that would go down the row and plant these Seed, seed corn, for example, exactly at the same point, 18 inches or 12 inches or however far farmers plant those corn. What they did back then was they plowed up a field and they, they took seed and they went. Now what happens if you take a handful of seed and just drop it? Clumps up, doesn't it? And all your plants grow in one place. If you want your plants to be spread out, you have to be able to cast that seed. And let it spread out over the area so it'll grow. That's what God wants us to do with the financial resources that He's blessed us with. He wants us to scatter. He wants us to give generously. That word, same word is used in Psalm 112 verse 9 that refers to giving generously to the poor. And so what God is asking us to do in this verse of Scripture is to be generous with the resources that He has given to us. We will do that if we'll remember one passage of Scripture. Write it down. Psalm 24, verse 1. Write it down. You don't have to look it up right now, but just write it down. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, which literally means everything in it. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it belongs to God. 
you may not know this, but you technically don't own anything. You may think you do. But what happens when you die? You can't take it with you, can you? It may stay in your family or your kids may fight over it or whatever, but you're sure not going to take it with you. So you really don't own it. The Bible indicates that God is the owner of all things on this planet. And including the planet itself and the universe in which the planet sits. God owns it all. And God simply entrusts us with resources. And it's required of a steward what? That a man be found faithful. What God has entrusted to us, He wants us to be faithful in blessing others. Read throughout the Bible. God, when God called Abraham, He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And you're going to be a blessing. And ultimately in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Folks, that's God's way of doing things. When God blesses us, it is so that you and I can be a blessing to others. What we read in this passage is consistent with other passages of Scripture that we find in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful or a hilarious giver. You know, we talk about giving till you hurt. What about giving till you laugh? Giving till you chuckle. That's what it's really saying. God loves a cheerful giver. And look what he goes on to say. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply, listen, and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Folks, the God that entrusts you with resources is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than you and I could ever begin to think or imagine. When God entrusts us with resources, it's so that you and I can be a blessing to others. And as we freely bless other people, as we freely scatter what it is that God's entrusted to us, then God blesses us. Malachi chapter 3.10, bring the full tithe. The tithe was a tenth, a tenth of the increase. Typically in Israel's time, it was a tenth of the increase of the flock or of the grain, whatever it happened to be that you were doing. In any way that God had blessed you, you were a tenth of it belonged to the Lord. He says, bring a full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down upon you a blessing until there is no more need. Have you ever been blessed till you didn't have any more needs? God can do that, folks. God will do that. He's promised to take care of us. He goes on to say, I'll rebuke the devourer so that you will not destroy, that it will not destroy the fruits of your soul. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of all creation, the Lord of all uh, hosts, whether it be heavenly or earthly host. Here's what I know from personal experience. God blesses us to be a blessing to other people. It's happened in my life, in Lisa's life. We've been, we've been fortunate. God's blessed us. We've been able to bless others. But guess what? You can never outgive God. Now, listen to me carefully. God's not saying that if you put one dollar in the offering plate that God's going to give you a dollar back. Or God's going to give you two dollars or three dollars. What God says is He's going to meet your needs. You know, some of the greatest needs we have are not financial. I, I know people that give every penny of money they own for just good health. You know, sometimes God's blessings are... He blesses us with less repair bills. You remember what this, the children of Israel did when they wandered in the desert? They wandered 40 years, and guess what? The Bible says their sandals never wore out. Now, how'd that happen? It was a God thing, okay? 
Sometimes God blesses us by having less repairs. Sometimes He blesses us by giving us better health. Sometimes He blesses us in other ways. It's not always with financial resources. There's other ways that God can bless us. But here's what I do know. God will meet every one of our needs according to His riches and glory. How much does God own? Can He not bless you wherever you are right now? Whether you have a lot or whether you have little, God can bless who and where you are. God has so many different kinds of blessings that He literally, as the Scripture says, lavishes them upon us. God doesn't just meagerly give out His resources. I, I like the word lavish. It always reminds me of spreading butter on, on, on a biscuit. I've got made y'all hungry, didn't I, Brother Jimmy? You, you ready to go get a biscuit now? I, I can't stand to go to these restaurants where they give you this one little bitty dollop and they want you to put that on a bit. That's not even, you can't even taste it. You know, I grew up with my grandfather who taught me how to put a half a stick of butter in a bowl of oats, you know. I want it lavished. I don't want just a little bit. God doesn't just dole out His blessings by a little bit, folks. He lavishes them upon us in Christ Jesus. We can be a blessing to others. How can we, be th how can we show our thankfulness to God this year? By giving, by ministering to people's needs, by sharing, by giving cheerfully. We're talking about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Folks, all that money goes to help tell people about Jesus. That's one way to give. There's other ways to give. There's people that, need, that are hungry, that need food. We need to be able to help them out. There's so many different ways that we can give. We just need to listen to what God tells us to do. Well, lastly... Lastly, another way that we can be a blessing unto others is that we can water those who need to be watered. Is that not what it says in this passage? In verse 25, the one who waters will himself be watered. Folks, we are the possessors of living water. I remember listening to a conference speaker one time at Union University. It's been probably 10 or 15 years ago. And this is just how much impression it made on my life that I still remember it today. She talked about the verse of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 where we're, we're literally the aroma of Christ. We are the aroma of Christ. And she talked about us, the, the responsibility that we had to splash living water on other people. My granddaughter is, is kind of curious like her mama was. And this past week, I asked my daughter if I could FaceTime so I could see my grandbabies. You know, parents, parents like to do those kind of things. Grandparents like to see their grandbabies. And she said, no, I can't right now. I'm cleaning up a bottle of cologne. And what had happened was my granddaughter had find, found a her, bottle of her dad's cologne. And I don't know if she dumped it out or if she busted the jar, but whatever. Can you imagine what that bathroom must have smelled like? You know, a little bit of cologne smells good, but a whole lot is just almost overpowering, isn't it? Folks, we are to be the aroma of Christ. We are to splash living water on other people. Let me share with you just a couple of ways that we can do that. One of all, who are some of those that need to be watered? Well, the sick. The sick need to be watered. Some of you have brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of you have personal family members or even some that you work with or know that live with constant pain. And you and I can, can be, minister to them. We can splash living water on them. Others are sick for a period of time. Maybe just a note of encouragement, a card. Uh, maybe taking some food over to somebody's house to minister to them while they're hurting. Folks, there are ways that you and I can splash living water on other people. Some are nursing home patients. And they're there for the rest of their lives. We can minister to them. A young lady who's a nurse in a nursing home at one of the churches that I pastored before wrote this on Facebook this week. She said, somebody posted on here to pray for our nurses. And yes, we all need prayer, but it's the residents that need prayers the most. Some of them don't understand where they are anymore. They roam their halls looking for loved ones in fear uh, because they can't find them. Or they live in a past world that no longer exists. They are trapped by their minds that they can't comprehend as they, and they can't comprehend as they used to. They don't understand reality anymore. 
It's always been my privilege as pastor to go in and out of nursing homes and places where I've served as pastor. I've had family members of those who are in the nursing home that says, Pastor, I just can't go in that place. I don't like the way it smells. Or I don't like the fact that one of these days, that's probably where, that, this they don't say, but this is probably the real reason. I may end up in one of those places one of these days and I don't want to know what it's like. But folks, those people, I, I still remember this one nursing home that I used to go in. But there was a wall right here. As you went in, like you went in the door right here, and there was a long wall right here. And it was kind of an inset thing where you had a wall that came out here. And everybody would line up in their wheelchairs on that wall. And they just wanted somebody to acknowledge that they were still a human being and that they were still in the world. And you'd go by, and I couldn't go by and just visit my church members. I had to stop and, and, and shake hands and talk to all of them. And they literally would just grab a hold of your hand and hold on for dear life. Just because they wanted somebody to acknowledge that they're still a human being. Guys, we can splash living water in a place like that. If you're not doing anything in our church, I encourage you. We, we've got a nursing home ministry going on. And you want to have your day brightened. Go, go to the nursing home when we start singing all those old hymns and their eyes brighten up. And they start singing them all by memory. You're sitting there with a hymn book trying to remember the words. And they know every word to every song you're singing. And they've got a grin all over their face. Because it brings joy to their life. Folks, we need to splash living water on those who are sick. Secondly, we need to splash living water on those who are despondent and hopeless. You know, we, we've got some people, and you know some people that have lost hope. I read on Facebook this morning where the son of uh, a nephew of one of the pastor friends that I know committed suicide, took his life because he was hopeless, didn't have any hope left. Guys, their depression, if you don't know this already, depression's real. You know how some people have diabetes because they've got a chemical imbalance in their body that causes diabetes? Well, some people have chemical imbalances in their body that causes them to be depressed all the time. And they need encouragement. We need to come alongside them and, and tell them that we love them and tell them that we care about them. And share with them about how Christ loves them and cares about them. We need to splash living water in their lives. Give them something to look forward to. It may be a phone call or a note or going by just to sit down and visit with them sometime or, or taking them fishing or doing something, but just somehow or another helping them to get through the time that they're going through. Some people have terrible home lives. And nobody in their family loves them. You and I need to splash living water on them. We need to go by and love on them. Help them to understand that they're cared for. We need to show mercy and grace. The same mercy and grace that God has shown to us, we need to show to them. We have some that are going through particularly hard trials right now. We need to splash their lives with living water. We don't need to gossip about them. We don't need to ignore them. We need to water them. Someone has written certain plants after wilting from the fierceness of the sun have droop leaves and look as if they will die but as soon as water is poured to the roots they recover folks there's some people going through trials right now we need to pour living water and a bunch of it right now they need to know that they're loved they need to know that they're cared for they need to experience we need to be the aroma of Christ to them as they're suffering right now some members have wandered away from the church. They're backslidden. We need to love them in Christ. We need to, they need to be watered. Somebody said we don't, uh, when, we, when they begin to forsake the house of God, do not forsake them. Follow after them with your tears. Galatians says it this way, Brothers, if anybody's caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, <coughs> lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Folks, we ought not ever let anybody wander away from the body of Christ and not go after them. In fact, if you remember, Jesus told a parable, didn't he? About a hundred sheep. And one of those sheep went astray. What did the shepherd do? He left the ninety-nine and he went in search for that one sheep. Because that one sheep was vulnerable. He needed help. Folks, it's not just the preacher's responsibility to go after those people that quit coming to church. It's all of our responsibilities. They're part of our body. We are all one body of Christ. And they're part of who we are. 
What would happen if your head decided to take a vacation? If it wandered off? You know, my dad used to tell me all the time, you know, you, you know, your head, your head needs to be tied on. You're gone, you know, you're out here somewhere. What would happen if one of your arms decided to just take a vacation today? Would you not be with the other arm going? You see, there are people, folks, that are part of the body of Christ. That have wandered away. They're backslidden. They've wandered away from the Lord. And we need to lovingly go and try to restore them. Now, they may not take it well and they may not be willing to listen. But we don't need to give up on them. We need to splash living water. We don't need to criticize or condemn them. We just need to love on them. Help them to realize that they're part of this body that they need to be here. We need to reach out to those. Folks, the children and youth of our church need to be watered. Do you understand that most kids form their character when they're very, very young? Some of the kids and children that come to our church have terrible home lives. Some of them have godly teachers that can help some, but their hands are tied by governmental policies about what they can and can't do. But while they're here in this church, folks, we can splash living water on their lives. You know what I've seen happen? In, I haven't seen that happen in Rock Hill, thank goodness, okay? But what I've seen happen in other churches, well, all those kids are doing are making marks on the walls and dis disorganizing everything. Folks, they need to hear about Jesus. I guarantee you, if you don't have anything to do, I, Chris can find you some of those kids that you can pour your life into. Those kids need to know about Jesus. We need to help them. We need to splash living water because if they don't get saved before they graduate from high school, the likelihood of them getting saved is somewhere between slim and none. We need to splash living water. Those who don't know Christ need to be splashed with living water. There are people out there that are perishing every day, folks, without Jesus. And they're going out into eternity without Christ. And they're, gonna, they're going to a place where the Bible says the wrath of God is going to be poured out on them for all eternity. Do we not care? Do we not care that people are going to hell? I think if, if God would give us all, just every one of us, just one, one second or one minute's worth a glimpse of hell... It would light our fire to go tell people about Jesus. One way we can be thankful and show our thankfulness to God is by telling other people about His Savior, about His Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, we are the aroma of Christ. We need to splash living water. In fact, all of God's children need to be watered at one time or another. We won't make it through every day without a fresh supply of God's grace. And I'm so thankful that the mercies of God are new each and every morning. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to water. We need to splash living water on the lives of other people around us while we have time. While they're hurting. Wherever they are. It is one way that we can give and show mercy to those that need mercy. Well, there's a number of different ways that we can show our thanksgiving to God. And one of the ways is by giving, by being merciful to others who need mercy, by giving financially so that other people can come to know Christ or other people's needs can be met, but also coming alongside them and splashing the living water of Jesus Christ on them so they can see what it, know, what it means to be a Christian, so they can see what it means, so they know what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. A Greek historian desired very intensely to say a word about the people in the city where he grew up. He couldn't write history without saying something about his hometown. And so this is what he wrote. While Athens was building temples and Sparta was waging war, my countrymen were doing nothing. Let me ask you a question. Ask yourself this question as we close this morning. What am I doing that is being a blessing to somebody else? What am I doing that's being a blessing to somebody else? If you say nothing, I challenge you. Change that today. 
Repent and ask God's forgiveness and ask God to help you be a person of influence that blesses the lives of other people around you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Fathers, we come to a sacred time of invitation. Lord, as your Holy Spirit deals with each of our hearts, Father, I pray that we'll listen and that Father will obey. Father, I know that your word never goes out and returns void. It always accomplishes what you intend. And Father, I pray that your word to us today would bear fruit. Father, there's somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they would come to understand the grace that is theirs and can be theirs in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a believer today, but you're not serving Christ, if you think church is all about me and having my needs met, I just want to ask you to change your attitude today. Decide that you're going to begin to be a blessing to other people around you. If you're having a problem with that, remember what Christ has done for you. Christ left the splendor of heaven and came and lived among us and became our substitute. He went to the cross and died in our place, taking upon Himself the punishment of our sins so that we might be forgiven. Remember His crucified body. Remember the bruises and the beating that He took. Remember the nail prints in His hands and His feet. Remember the sp spear that was shoved up in His side. Remember all that Christ has done for you. And that then remind yourself that you have been bought with a price in order that you might glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which now belong to God. Decide to, to make a difference in the world around you. Decide to show your thanksgiving by being a blessing to others today. If you're here today and your life has not been transformed, if you've never been born again, if your life has not been transformed by the power of God, I want you to know that God loves you. We as Christians may not always love you like we ought. and We don't always do the right thing, but God loves you. He loves you just like you are. And he offers to you today living water. When he met with the woman at the well, he told her, the person who drinks from the water that I offer will have a fountain of, of water springing up into eternal life. Jesus offers eternal life to you today. How do you get it? Well, first of all, you have to admit that you're a sinner. And then you have to ask God to forgive you of your sins. And to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. And the Bible says if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. That's God's invitation for you this morning. If you don't know Christ, in just a moment we're going to have what we call a hymn of invitation. It's an invite for you to come and make a public decision to follow Christ or make a public decision to, to ask God to forgive you of your sins. Whatever the Holy Spirit is, is leading you to do, it's an opportunity for you to respond to this message. And so if there's a decision that you need to make today, would you do that? As Adam comes to lead us in a song.